A satellite floats in the cold depths of space above our pale blue dot. It positions its targeting array down at a point thousands of miles below, and fires. Clack, clack, clack. A tired-looking man sitting in a coffee shop types away on his computer, taking advantage of the free Wi-Fi to send off yet another job application. Nearby, a barista is writing down orders while a businessman takes a call between quiet sips of his mocha. A teenage girl texts her friend, giggling occasionally. An old man chews his bagel just a little too loudly for comfort. Nothing appears all that out of the ordinary. Until the blast hits. Intensity level 25. The job seeker notices a faint whisper in his ear. It startles him, and he turns to look around the coffee shop, but he can't spot who was whispering to him. How odd. He turns back to his keyboard and carries on typing, but a strange feeling hangs over him. This pervasive sense that something is very wrong. His eyes turn to the businessman, and he notices something. His phone is gone, but he's still loudly talking to someone. Someone who isn't there. The barista is smiling as she seems to note down orders, but in her notebook, she's scrawling the words, getting closer, again and again and again, and she doesn't have any idea why. The teenage girl, with shifty, furtive eyes, texts her friend a message saying, this is gonna sound crazy, but I feel like someone's watching me. As the job seeker tries in vain to fight the feelings of unease, he keeps hearing the old man chewing, loud, incessant, cow-like chewing. It's really beginning to get on his nerves. Suddenly, the thought crosses his mind that he'd actually like to kill this man. He'd like to squeeze his throat and break his jaw so that he could never chew like that again. The sudden appearance of this alien thought frightens him, and it's about to get so much worse. Intensity level 35. The job seeker starts to wonder if there's any point to this. He suspected that he'd been fired from his last job because nobody liked him. Did he really think he had a chance at getting this one? Really? What a stupid pipe dream. He's bombarded by thoughts like these that make typing more and more difficult. He notices that his hands are shaking. The chewing behind him is still so loud. He can't turn around. He knows on some level that if he does, he'll say something to the old man that he can't take back. The barista stares off into the distance, a haunted, contemplative look in her eye. The businessman gazes into his mocha like a crystal ball. The teenage girl begins to weep. The job seeker looks up when he notices something strange is happening outside. A middle-aged woman walking her dog suddenly clutches her chest like she's having a heart attack. She bends over and breathes deeply. Her dog barks at nothing, enraged by some invisible force that's all around them. Intensity level 50. Something's wrong. The voice in the job seeker's head is no longer a whisper. It's hissing and barking cruel words at him like, useless, worthless, lazy, disgusting. Each one boring into his head like a power drill. But far more frightening than the voices themselves is the fact that he believes every single thing they're saying. He's lulled into a trance by their venomous rhythm. The only thing louder is that unending chewing. The waitress calmly walks back to the counter. She picks up a jug of blistering hot coffee and begins to swig directly from it. She can feel it sizzling in her mouth, and she couldn't care less. The businessman begins an intense screaming match with somebody who isn't there, snarling and practically foaming at the mouth. The job seeker can't take that chewing anymore. He turns to the old man, ready to unload on him. But when he opens his mouth to speak, nothing comes out. He sees that the bagel is gone, but the old man is still chewing. He smiles at him, red liquid streaking his lips and teeth. The job seeker looks down at the table and sees the outline of a fingerless hand under the old man's blood-soaked napkin. Intensity level 75. Inside the coffee shop, pandemonium breaks loose. The old man lies catatonic in his booth. The businessman fights a nearby wall, knuckles and toe bones cracking against the bricks. The waitress has the teenage girl in a headlock as the girl shrieks in agony and stabs at her assailant's leg with a table fork. The job seeker looks out the window at the violence suddenly unfolding on the street. Complete strangers are attacking each other with murderous intent, biting, gouging, punching, clawing, tearing, strangling. It all looks like… fun. He picks up his laptop and tosses it through the coffee shop window, shattering the glass, as if he was ever going to get that stupid job anyway. He steps through the broken window, a new man, and picks up a large, jagged shard of broken glass, ready to join in on the festivities. Intensity level Keter. Thousands of people are changed. They do unimaginable things to each other and themselves. There is chaos in homes and out on the streets as everything collapses in a wave of terrible, unspeakable violence. Nothing, 
will ever be the same. Thankfully, the horrors that you just observed were only part of a simulation, one created by the SCP Foundation and intended to demonstrate the worst-case scenarios of various anomalies on their roster. These events have not yet come to pass, but they very easily could if there was even a minor accident with the rogue anomalous satellite known as SCP-923. The SCP-923 satellite consists of a large parabolic dish made from unknown alloys, as well as a powerful internal reactor that produces massive quantities of energy and radiation, all to power the satellite's mysterious anomalous firing mechanism. 923 appears to select specific targets that it then fires a blast of energy at. Those in the proximity of the target when the beam hits are also affected, with the severity of the damage contingent on the intensity of the blast. Like many anomalies, its origins are shrouded in mystery. SCP-923 displays a degree of artificial intelligence and posts reports on its own condition and operations to the O5 Council Secured Information Relay Network, a classified communication network reserved for Foundation employees with Level 5 clearance. According to 923's own data, it was constructed in a Foundation research and development site. This is congruent with blueprints for a planned offensive satellite which was to be constructed at that very site but the project had actually been cancelled due to logistical concerns. The O5 Council deems it extremely important that SCP-923 never be made aware of this fact. Currently, since two-way lines of communication have been established, 923 obeys the orders of the O5 Council, not firing on a target unless given authorization by them. If it ever discovers that it technically isn't a Foundation construction, it runs the risk of going rogue and triggering some extremely dangerous outcomes, to say the least. SCP-923 was first discovered after it started a correspondence with the O5 Relay Network, posting a message that it had completed another successful termination, despite no such termination actually being ordered. Over the next several hours, this process continued as the 923 satellite sent in termination report after termination report, totaling 57 by the time it stopped, 55 of which were later confirmed to be actual deaths, with the other two being deemed inconclusive. Adjustments have since been made to ensure that SCP-923 can't access any information on the network that hasn't been directly intended for it. SCP-923 is an extremely effective weapon. Depending on its operator's level of tolerance for collateral damage, it can completely reverse its orbit to detect and fire upon a target anywhere on Earth in a very short period of time. All it needs are the target's GPS coordinates, their altitude, the intended time of firing, and a selected level of intensity. This, incidentally, is where things get interesting with the tests the Foundation conducted. Naturally, they wanted to see the kind of firepower that each level of intensity was capable of, so D-classes were requested for live tests. The first test performed was at intensity level 10. However, this resulted in an error message, claiming that the 923 satellite isn't capable of firing at an intensity lower than level 23. In accordance with this new information, the Foundation planned the next test at intensity level 25, this time, the effects immediately took hold. The target and those nearby began to experience a degree of paranoid delusion. They would report hearing voices and be seen interacting with people who weren't there. They would experience a sense of crushing terror, impending doom, and also report the growing desire to cause harm to others. Most of all, in debriefing interviews, they would claim that they felt like they were being watched, though they refused to elaborate on what exactly they meant by that. Recovery time from this condition was measured at being between 15 and 19 days. Next came the test at intensity level 35. Everyone affected experienced symptoms similar to intensity level 25, except with powerful new self-destructive compulsions. The area of effect also grew with the increased power. Researchers who thought they were safe over 10 meters away collapsed to the ground in intense panic attacks. The effects were much longer on this setting too, and recovery from this intensity took 6 to 8 months. Interestingly, during the test there was a severe disruption to the audio-visual equipment. Some devices had been displaced, others were fused to the ground. The video footage was corrupted beyond use, but the audio retrieved displayed nothing out of the ordinary. However, when survivors of the test were asked to listen to the recorded audio, they claimed to once again hear the voices that were in their head that day and experience the terrible feelings and compulsions start up again. One of the researchers appended a note to the file which read, It looks like this thing actually has a blast effect to it and is not just a laser of madness. The audio and video feed disruptions are particularly interesting. From now on, researchers are to observe remotely, and D-class personnel are to be secured so they can't harm themselves. We need them alive for study. Next, the intensity was brought up to level 50 and the test was conducted once again. 
the results were once again similar to the previous one, but with far greater intensity and more pronounced physical effects on its victims. D-classes who were completely restrained still exhibited cuts and tears in their skin, and audio-visual recording equipment was displaced to an even greater degree than before. Victims of this intensity have not yet recovered, and Foundation researchers are not confident that they ever will. But the effects went further than just the people present. It appears that the area itself was subject to long-lasting effects. Staff who recovered the D-classes from the testing area reported an extreme sense of unease, claiming that the testing area simply felt wrong, but were unable to elaborate further. In spite of this, the tests continued to increase in intensity. Next, the level was increased to 75, and this is when things truly began to go off the rails. The satellite's target was rendered completely comatose, and the D-classes within 16 meters of him broke free from their restraints and began slaughtering each other with their bare hands. Disturbingly, many of the subjects, both living and dead, who were tested after the fact, seemed to bear wounds consistent with attacks by bladed weapons. None of the D-classes were armed, and the wounds seemed impossible to have been caused by mere fingers and teeth. There was an even greater displacement of recording devices, and some were missing after the test. The retrieved recordings caused even worse states of distress for those affected by the blast who were lucky enough to actually survive and could listen to them again. But it didn't end there. Anyone within 50 meters experienced intense panic attacks that often lasted longer than an hour. Observing researchers experienced what could best be described as a slightly more mild version of intensity level 25 symptoms. They reported hallucinations, things moving in the corners of their eyes, hearing voices, experiencing heightened paranoia and feelings of dread. There was even some poltergeist activity recorded, with objects seeming to move of their own accord. The lasting effects on the physical area are even more pronounced, with laser rangefinders indicating a level of permanent spatial distortion at the epicenter of the blast site. A researcher appended a note to this section of the file, reading, This is crossing the line from scientific to just barbaric. SCP-923 has said that its maximum output is 238, which it promptly converts to Keter intensity. Let's just see what this does and report our findings. However, the Keter level intensity proved to be too much to handle, so much so that the entry on its test log begins with the sentence, It is strongly advised that this intensity never be used again. The blast induced psychosis permanently in every subject within a truly insane two-kilometer radius, including a number of unfortunate researchers who severely underestimated the Keter level blast range. The site is now under permanent Foundation protection as SCP-92302, due to the permanent effects the blast had on the landscape. A sense of panic is still felt from hundreds of meters away, and anyone who gets close enough to the center will experience full-blown psychosis just as much as those directly affected by the beam. Spatial and temporal anomalies abound in the area, and the O5 Council has deemed SCP-923 a risk in causing an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. But the most frightening part of all is yet to come. Every time the SCP-923 weapon is used, it causes a degree of internal damage to the satellite itself, raising the threshold of intensity that the weapon needs to even activate. It used to be that the satellite would fire at intensity level 23, but after extensive testing, its minimum intensity level is now 66. If the weapon is ever used again, it's only going to get worse. Despite this danger, SCP-923 has been classified as safe. But how is an object that is both out of Foundation control and able to operate with a dangerous degree of autonomy classified the same as harmless anomalies that require little to no containment procedures? The answer is buried in the question. The SCP Foundation cannot contain SCP-923, but seeing as there are currently over 7,500 active satellites orbiting planet Earth, 923 doesn't arouse much suspicion, especially with the Foundation cover story that it's merely a non-anomalous military satellite. The only continued containment effort required is making sure that other satellites do not enter its path of orbit to ensure that 923's advanced defense systems don't activate and destroy the interfering satellite, revealing its anomalous nature. Now go and watch another entry from the classified files of Dr. Bob, such as SCP-056, A Beautiful Person, or another SCP that'll drive you to do terrible things. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.